November 5th, 1975. We find seven men walking through the darkened woods outside the town of Snowflake, Arizona. Their stomachs growled at them, demanding supper. Their heavy eyelids drooped down, begging for rest, and their numb fingers told them to seek warmth. They had been working outside since dawn, and were well overdue to return to their families. But as much as they wished to return home, the silent, verdant woods soothed their minds. It was beautiful this time of day. The roar of the chainsaws and hacking of their axes filled their ears for hours, leaving little room for peace and quiet. The soft flapping of the bats above them, out for their nightly feast, and the faint songs of the crickets filled the air. None would admit it, but the woods were like a paradise, a sanctuary only a few would ever fully understand. It was ironic, a logging crew falling in love with the very forest they were there to steal a part of. By the glow of their flashlights, the seven of them walked in tandem, following the man in front to help guide them back to their truck. The lonely dirt forest road they had arrived on didn't offer them any source of light to see where they were going. The sun, just moments ago, disappeared beyond the horizon, while the moon peeked through the fir trees, trying its best to help the loggers in finding their way. Sometimes, while the looming darkness closed in around them, they could swear they were traveling in the wrong direction from just how long it would take them to return to their vehicles. But tonight was thankfully different. They arrived safely and without issue back to their work truck, loaded their belongings and themselves inside, and started the quiet, slow drive back towards town. Usually this would be the time for a few members of their team to get some shut-eye, to get a jump on their nighttime routine. But this night would play out differently. They wouldn't make it very far before the driver had to slam on the brakes, bringing the truck to a skidding stop. Before them, it looked as if the moon was shining brighter, emitting a brilliant light that nearly blinded the seven men. Then it drew closer. They immediately realized the shimmering light in the sky wasn't the moon at all, that it was something else entirely. It moved gracefully across the night sky, hovering slowly above the trees as the group of men watched in disbelief. One of them decided this was a sight he couldn't pass up to get a closer look at, so against the protest from the others, he climbed out of his truck and sprinted towards the saucer-shaped object now levitating a few hundred yards away. The young man was almost in a trance-like state as the hypnotizing lights pulsed rapidly into his eyes. The others back at the vehicle yelled and hollered for him to come back, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. Suddenly, a blue beam of light shot out from the floating disc, illuminating his entire body. It drew him upwards, lifting his feet gently off the ground as his friends watched in horror. As it continued to hoist the young man into the sky, the truck full of men bolted from the scene, leaving behind their friend in the clutches of this mysterious aircraft from the stars. Travis Walton, the man who was left behind and sucked into the sky, would go down in history as having one of the most bizarre and compelling UFO abduction stories of all time. And as his friends drove off, the realization of what they had just done hit them like a brick wall. They had to go back for their colleague, their friend. But when they had returned back to the scene where they had left him, both Travis and the light in the sky had vanished without a trace. I'm your host, Jordan Hopkins, and you're listening to another episode of the Moonlight Lore Podcast. Awkward silence filled the cramped office as the six men sat across the desk from Sheriff Chuck Ellison. He stared at them, trying to decide in his mind if what they had just told him was the truth, or if they were trying to pull a fast one on him. Of course, the idea that a UFO had come along and kidnapped Travis was all too fantastical. It was a story that he suspected was the cover for something far more sinister. As he looked each man in the eye, The conclusion that the six men had murdered the young Travis crossed his mind, but he wanted to hear their story again. He looked towards Mike Roger, the crew boss and good friend of Travis, and asked him to run through the night's events once more, just so he can fully comprehend what they believed had happened. Mike was likely annoyed that the officer standing before him was more interested in hearing their tale again rather than begin a search for Travis. 
He knew this reaction was due to him not believing them, and that overwhelming feeling of trying to convince someone of the truth who just wasn't buying it was growing his frustrations. With a defeated and exhausted sigh, Mike began his story again. Mike had a Forest Service contract to do a number of jobs in the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest over the past nine years, and this particular job tonight was part of a contract to clear brush from a 1,200-acre parcel of land to allow for the better growth of healthy trees. Mike was in charge. It was his crew consisting of Travis Walton, Alan Dalis, and John Goulet, as well as Dwayne Smith, Kenneth Peterson, and Steve Pierce. And despite their small number, they were an efficient bunch. As well as co-workers, they were all fairly decent friends as well, which always made the work easy. By the time they were finishing up for the day, the sun had already set half an hour before around 5.30, and they still had to walk back to their truck to make the 60-minute drive back to Snowflake. As everyone piled into the old pickup to their usual seats, Mike as the driver, Ken in the middle, and Travis riding shotgun, with the other four squeezed into the back seats, as they were all smokers and wished to light up a cigarette at the end of the night, they took off down the old dirt road and began their long journey home. As the truck bounced and wobbled down the potted path, the crew joked about how they were going to end up stranded in the middle of nowhere after the suspension on the truck broke down, while Mike patted the dash in front of him, defending his old vehicle, praising how she never let him down and always got him from point A to point B without any issues. That's when Travis shouted over them, raising his hand with his index finger pointing forwards. As everyone followed where he was gesturing, they caught sight of a brilliant light shining through the tops of the pine trees in front of them. As everyone quieted down to study it, they asked one another if it could be another vehicle's headlights, but Mike shot that idea down, saying nobody else would be out here on this road, especially at this time of day. Travis asked if it was possibly the sun, judging from just how bright it was shining, but immediately realized how ridiculous that was as the sun had set roughly 45 minutes ago. Maybe it was a group of hunters who had their headlights turned on or had a fire going. But as the group drove closer, they all silently realized this was likely not the case. With their eyes straining to see past the gnarled branches of the old forest, they watched as the source of light slowly revealed itself. The silence that had permeated in the truck before was nothing like it was now, as every man in the truck held their breath as their eyes grew wide and their jaws dropped. Mike slammed on the brakes as John yelled from the back seat to stop. It was like everyone was glued to the windows as they watched in amazement as a golden disc slowly floated 15 feet above the ground just a mere 30 yards from their parked position. The reality of their situation was quickly overwhelming them, as their rapid heartbeats were the only sounds for miles. Travis looked back at each of his friends' faces as they stared awestruck by this beautiful hovering craft before them. He turned to gaze upon it once more, but felt an urge come over him that no one else had. Curiosity had come over Travis. He didn't want to miss the chance of a lifetime to have a closer look at this magnificent golden machine. Without hesitation, he reached for the door handle and opened the door. That's what broke Mike's concentration. He whispered out to Travis, who was already halfway out the truck's door, asking what the hell he was thinking. But Travis didn't respond. He was too transfixed on the object, and without taking his eyes off it, he stalked closer towards the light, stepping carefully over the fallen trees that laid in his path. The others sat put, watching from the safety of the truck as their young colleague walked closer and closer to it, waiting for the craft to quickly retreat into the sky. But their worst fears dashed their hope. The floating craft began to wobble in the air. It started to move slightly towards Travis, and they were forced to helplessly watch as a beam of bluish-green light shot out from the bottom illuminating the young man now crouching down on the ground below. As if reality was changing right in front of their eyes, they observed Travis slowly be lifted off the ground, hovering just like the spacecraft was. It looked almost peaceful, but immediately his arms and legs craned backwards like he was being electrocuted. Then an invisible force seemed to violently hit him as he went flying backwards through the air about 10 feet, hitting the hard, cold ground. The men in the truck watched nervously as Travis's lifeless body laid limp against the rocks and dirt. They hoped he would be okay, but they were far too scared to go out and check. Mike was hesitant to leave his friend behind, but the others shouted and screamed at him to drive, to get away from the saucer that had just, from what they perceived, had killed Travis. 
He fumbled with the keys, trying to find the ignition, the others screaming in his ear to get the truck moving. His mind lost the thought of Travis lying helplessly on the ground and focused on getting himself and the others to safety. As reliable as it always was, Mike's truck finally roared to life once he found the ignition, and the group of men were out of there before they even had a chance to think about Travis again. The uncomfortable silence that filled the truck weighed heavy on the men. A million thoughts lingered in all of their minds, but nobody dared to speak first. As the others wrestled with the fact that they had just witnessed a real UFO, Mike thought about his best friend, the one they had just left behind in the dirt. Slamming on the brakes, he pulled the truck to a dead stop, which warranted puzzled looks from the others. But he didn't have to explain why. They knew why he stopped. Their conscience pulled at their minds and hearts, telling them to go back, telling them they needed to rescue their pal. There was very little deliberation between the group of men as Mike turned the truck around and drove back to the site they had just retreated from. But when they came into view of the clearing that once displayed an otherworldly sight, they were filled with a mixture of relief and worry. It was gone. The ship that had struck Travis and emitted those strange lights had vanished, likely back into the sky. But Travis was also gone. They searched the clearing and surrounding woods for 20 minutes. They spread out from one another and covered the entire area. They searched the blackened woods that surrounded them, but no sign of the man was seen. Mike bent down to inspect the spot where he saw Travis tossed to. It was cold, as if nobody had ever even been there. Their flashlights proved to offer little assistance against the looming darkness that swallowed them up. They knew they needed help. They needed to continue back to town and inform the authorities. Like a case of deja vu, Sheriff Ellison stared at the six of them shaking his head in a disapproving way. Not for a single second did he believe their story. It was all just too outlandish to believe. But regardless of if the story was true or not, the matter that Travis was missing was one he could not ignore. A search would have to be conducted for the young man, and members of the precinct were eager to get moving. As is often the case, the first few hours are crucial in determining the fate of the missing person. The police couldn't afford to sit around and listen to what they believed were made of fairy tales of spacemen any longer. So instructing Mike to show them where exactly the supposed spaceship had abducted Travis, a small search party headed out to the clearing where the man was last seen. Of course, the always nerve-shattering task of informing the family of the bad news was something that also needed to be done. So while the officers and Mike scoured through the dark woodlands in the dead of night, one of the poor officers at the station was pressured into that dreaded phone call to Travis's mother. As he listened to the line ring, the officer tapped the handset against his temple, his mind racing, trying to find the proper words to describe the situation. But before he was able to gather his full thoughts, Mrs. Walton picked up on the other end and asked why she was being disturbed at this late hour. With maybe not as much tact as the situation called for, the officer plainly described to her what they had learned that night, that her son was missing, and there was a small party already in the process of finding him. Surprisingly, after the officer shared the story Travis's co-workers had told them, Mrs. Walton seemed rather calmer than most would think, almost as if she already knew what had happened to her son. Dwayne, Travis's older brother, decided to then reach out to the UFO group based in Phoenix called the Ground Saucer Watch, who then advised him if Travis ever did return someday to take a urine sample from him for testing, and to bring the sample and Travis down to Phoenix immediately for a medical examination. The following morning didn't shed any light on what could have happened to the lost young man. A small army of investigators from across the state descended onto Snowflake, backed by both the local law enforcement and volunteers who all scoured the forest to no avail. No clue on where Travis was or what truly happened to him revealed itself, much to the frustration of the officers trying to piece together the case. The only information they had was the bizarre story told to them by the six lumberjacks, which made them the only current people of interest. After several days of fruitless searching, the police decided to subject the six men to a lie detector test to find the truth. The investigators all believed they had murdered Travis in the woods, so surely the polygraph test would reveal that they were hiding something. At the request of the officers, Cy Gilson was brought in to conduct the tests. 
He took each cooperative man into a room at the back of the station and spent hours grilling each of them alone, trying to trip them up, trying to make them contradict one another. But they all stuck to the same story, and possibly most surprising of all, each of them passed the test. Every man aside from one whose test turned out inconclusive was telling the truth, or so the polygraph would say. Cy Gilson fully believed these men saw something strange flying through the sky that night, and whatever happened to Travis Walton was not their doing. The media frenzy that followed was unlike anything the small town of Snowflake would ever see or ever see again. News outlets who caught wind of the developing story and the testimonies from the six lumberjacks being proven right captivated millions from around the globe. As papers printed the story, it evolved into radio hosts talking about it, and after that, television programs picked it up too. People from other countries were desperate for the next twist that would change the direction of the case. They waited for new developments, but when the investigators were told to drop the case by Mrs. Walton, everyone feared the mystery behind the young man's abduction would be left unsolved. The family seemed to just want to be left alone, and since the officers had no further threads they could follow, they decided to slow the investigation down a bit. They would still search for Travis, but just not to the extent that they had been for the past four days. But despite things slowing down, this didn't stop people from wondering what happened to the young man. UFO groups and the common citizen were, for a moment, all in the same boat. Skeptics and believers wanted the same thing. They wanted Travis found, alive and safe. His family most of all. Mrs. Walton sat up each night, staring out her window at the starlit sky, wishing she could see her son again, while Dwayne paced back and forth on the front lawn, wondering where his brother really was. However, unlike his mother, his thoughts weren't of worry for Travis. They were rather of envy. It had been well known in their younger years the two boys would often stay up at night, dreaming of flying off into space on an extraterrestrial spaceship, having adventures on faraway planets and interacting with friendly aliens. Dwayne was jealous. He of course hoped Travis would be safe in his travels, but that lingering thought in the back of his mind told him he was missing out on something incredible. Slowly, as the days passed by, people began wondering if Travis would ever be found. He had disappeared without a trace. The police couldn't find him. His friends and co-workers shared fantastical rumors. It wouldn't be until five days after his appearance would a break in the case occur. On November 10th, Travis's sister, who was asleep at the time, received a midnight call. At first, when she answered, nothing but short static could be heard ringing down the line. But then... The familiar voice she so desperately wanted to hear broke the silence. Travis Walton was back. Stunned to hear her brother's voice through the crackling phone, she stood speechless as Travis's brother-in-law, Grant Neff, grabbed the phone away and demanded to know where Travis had been and where he was. It was clear, though, that Travis was in rough shape, judging just by his coarse, empty voice, which barely strung along a sentence. What Grant could get out of him, however, was that the kid was calling from a payphone outside a gas station 30 miles away in Haber, Arizona. So telling Travis to stay put, Grant called Dwayne, and the two of them sped off down the highway to collect their brother. It didn't take them long to make the journey, and when they arrived, they found Travis, slumped over in a payphone booth, incredibly delirious, dehydrated, and starving. It was clear to the two that they needed to get him some help, so Dwayne instructed Grant to drive them down to Phoenix, where they would meet with the ground saucer watch, who had promised to have their doctor, Lester Stewart, care for Travis. When they had arrived, Dwayne was frustrated to find that their so-called doctor was actually only a hypnotherapist. Now, Dwayne wasn't about to let these people study Travis like a lab rat, so instead opted to just allow them to have the urine sample they had requested and to take Travis back home to Snowflake, where he would rest and seek some proper medical attention. But through all the excitement of Travis coming home, Dwayne completely forgot to inform the police of his return. Instead, they found out through the media, who had descended like vultures once rumors of Travis being back spread. For the next following days, after his recovery of course, Travis, Dwayne, and Mike were all subjected to rigorous questioning at the hands of the public, but they mostly discussed their ordeal with interested UFO investigators, likely because they were the only ones who were taking their claim seriously. Many people still believed the Waltons and the Six Lumberjacks were in on some kind of hoax, but just couldn't pinpoint why. 
The police were the most suspicious. They traveled to the location where Dwayne and Grant claimed to have found Travis collapsed in a phone booth and inquired with the phone company to check their records. Apparently, according to the company, a call was indeed placed to Travis's sister and brother-in-law's house from the phone booth, but when the police inspected and dusted the booth for Travis's fingerprints, none could be found. At around this time of the follow-up investigation to see if the Waltons were telling the truth or not, the National Enquirer took an interest in the story. They had a long-standing prize offered to anyone who could prove that UFOs were indeed extraterrestrials, and they reached out to the Waltons to ask if Travis would be willing to conduct a lie detector test himself. At first, both Travis and Dwayne seemed to show some resistance to the idea, but after being offered a lump sum somewhere in the ballpark of over 100 grand if Travis passed, they relented and agreed. The Inquirer also sweetened the deal, saying if, for whatever reason, Travis didn't pass, they would not release the results of the test to the public. It was a win-win situation for the Waltons, so they eagerly agreed. The Inquirer employed an examiner named McCarthy, who conducted the test in a secure location, and by the end of both Travis's and Dwayne's test, he described the results as the plainest case of lying he had ever seen in 20 years, to which Dwayne responded by threatening, according to those who overheard the conversation. But as agreed, the National Enquirer did not publish the failed examination for the public. Local UFO investigators were not satisfied with the failed results of the Enquirer's test, however, so they arranged for another polygraph to be done by a different examiner named Pfeiffer. According to him, the test would come back as inconclusive, no clear sign if Travis was telling the truth or if he was making it up. The UFO groups then told a different story. They told the public the test came back in favor of Travis and his story was indeed true. Fast forward a short time later, the UFO group, APRO, which stands for Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization and linked to the National Enquirer, somehow convinced Travis to undergo a hypnotherapy session to fully unlock and reveal what he had experienced. The following account is from Travis Walton and what took place immediately after his friends abandoned him in the clutches of a spacecraft on the night of November 5, 1975. Travis slowly opened his eyes from his prone position in a daze. His entire body burned with an unfamiliar feeling that shot aches and pains into every limb. It was difficult for him to lift his eyelids. His vision refused to focus and tell him where exactly he was. All he knew was that a blinding white light shone above him where he lay. At first, he thought he was on the forest floor, looking up at the ominous glow of the flying saucer, but quickly realized as he turned his head, he was inside a room. His mouth was dry, aside from the metallic taste of his own blood layering his tongue. He tried to sit up, but found the vertical and pain coursing through his body did its best to keep him down. While he lay there, wondering to himself where he was, he came to the conclusion that he must be at the hospital. His friends had rescued him and brought him to safety. But that all changed when he noticed the strange shape of the unfamiliar room. The ceiling was triangular, with one side larger than the other. It was crooked, he thought. The hot, humid air was heavy and almost stifled his breath. Odd for a ventilated hospital room in early November. He shifted slightly, trying to find the comfort that eluded him. A touch of cold caught him off guard. He looked down and saw he still had his work boots on and all his clothing. It was weird the nurses hadn't removed them. It must have been an emergency and there was no time. However, his shirt and jacket were raised up, exposing his abdomen. Through his blurry vision, he was able to spot the source of the out-of-place coldness he felt. A strange device, about four or five inches thick, curved across his body. The shiny, dark metal extended all the way from his armpits down to his ribcage and to above his belt. It was unlike any instrument he had ever seen in his life. Looking past that, he noticed movement beyond his feet. The blurry figures of the doctors moved about the room, staring at him, wearing orange-colored surgical gowns and their white face masks and caps. Relieved he was being taken care of, he rested his head back down on the warm, hard table, resting his eyes for just a moment. But that's when he realized those doctors didn't quite look right. His eyes shot open and he slowly lifted his head to peer back at them. They were there all right. They weren't a figment of his imagination, but they were certainly not human. It wasn't surgical masks or caps that they were wearing. 
It was their skin. They had pale white skin and bulbous heads which hosted two luminous brown eyes the size of quarters. They watched him frantically panic as he attempted to stand on his wobbling legs. Two approached on his right. He pushed the closest one back, falling backwards into its compatriot. He remembered the touch felt wrong, not like that of touching a human. Through its orange jumpsuit, it felt as if it was incredibly light, the reason why he was able to push it back so easily in his weakened state. It also had a strange sponginess to it, more like fat than sinew. Every instinct told him to run, but it felt like his body refused to listen to his mind. As Travis stood to full height, the metal contraption that had been resting on his abdomen crashed to the floor, falling completely off his body as he backed away into the wall. The three creatures stood there, seemingly trying to calm their patient, but lacking the language skills to do so. As they cautiously approached the frightened man, Travis reached beside him grabbing a thin, transparent cylinder about 18 inches long to defend himself with. But realizing it wasn't long enough to make an effective club, he tried smashing it against the table it was on so he could potentially stab the beings approaching. But he was stunned to find no matter how hard he swung, the cylinder would not break. He decided to make the best of what he had and cowered in the corner like a trapped wild animal, swinging his makeshift club around like a madman, cursing and yelling at the figures to keep away. They listened, but only for a moment. They froze for a brief second, which gave Travis time to breathe a single breath of relief. But then they began walking towards him again, their arms outstretched to reach for him. Their nailless fingers beckoned for him, motioning for him to come to them. Travis didn't listen. He was too fixated on the monster's facial features to know what to do. Their small bodies held up their bulging heads which housed human-like features but were proportionally off. They had small jaws and little thin lips that never opened. Their tiny noses were nothing more than just two small nostrils, similar to that of their small lobes for ears. No hair was visible on their bodies, not a single eyelash or eyebrows decorating their eyes, not a hair on their thin long hands or on their round heads. They were drawing closer now, and Travis realized he had ceased swinging, giving them a chance to get too close for comfort. Immediately, he started screaming and swinging once more, which must have been enough to frighten the creatures to retreat and disappear out an open door. Travis slumped down on the bench he had woken up from, wondering to himself what was happening as his eyes locked with the open exit. Nothing came back through the door, and finding very little else in the room to defend himself with, a daring Travis decided to take the risk and journey out of the room to investigate. What he was met with was an empty, curving hallway that illuminated a faint glow, enough for him to see down. As he discreetly ventured down the empty hall, he noticed a room to his right. He approached and peeked around the corner to find that it was empty, aside from a single chair purposely set in the center of the room facing away from him. Looking back down the hall, it too was still empty, so he decided to take the moment to investigate. He wandered in, circling the strange little chair, and found it had a lever, buttons, and a glowing screen on the armrest. He tried to decipher the symbols that were glowing on the screen, but found he couldn't understand them. The dark room, which only seemed to grow darker the closer he got to the chair, continued to draw his curiosity. He knew he probably shouldn't touch anything, but he was desperate. If even just one of these buttons or the lever opened a hidden door, he needed to take the chance. He decided on pressing a green button, but nothing happened. The only thing that had changed were the lines on the screen had moved to a different position than what they had been in before. He pressed another button, then another and another. All they seemed to do was make the lines on the screen move around. Nothing helpful. The next step was to sit down in the uncomfortable looking chair and move the lever. He slowly pushed it and watched as the faint, small lights on the walls of the room moved. At that moment, he realized the twinkling dots he had perceived as lights were actually of their purest form. They were distant stars. He was looking off into the blackness of space and never even realized it until this moment. He stood back up, staring down at the buttons on the chair, wondering to himself if he should dare push more. But that's when he heard a faint sound behind him. The door he had come through was now blocked. Someone stood in his way between him and the exit. But it wasn't one of those small, pale creatures he had encountered before. What stood before him was another human being. (laughs) 
Travis stood frozen in place, unsure of what to do or say to the six foot two muscular man standing in front of him. He had a blue jumpsuit that clung tightly to his body in a similar fashion that the orange ones did to those creatures who he had interacted with mere minutes ago. Believing this man would be his salvation from this nightmare, Travis ran up to him, babbling about his experience so far, all while the man stood calmly, taking in every panicked ramble. Without a single word, the mysterious man firmly, yet also gently, gripped Travis's arm, beckoning him to follow down the narrow hallway towards a closed door. For the next little while, it seemed the man was giving Travis a bit of a tour around the strange ship, showing him from room to room and letting Travis observe the objects and lights in each. They were alone for the most part, up until the end of the tour, when the man led Travis into a room with a table and chairs in the middle, but those weren't what drew Travis's attention. There were two more men and a single woman standing there, watching the two enter the room. They wore similar outfits as the man who was guiding him and had seemingly perfect skin. Travis took this opportunity to address them, asking them a million questions like where they were and what was going on. But like the first man, the three stood silent. Waiting for a response, Travis grew more agitated. He needed at least one answer to his millions of questions, but no matter how he tried to ask, the four refused to answer. One of the men, along with the woman, then approached Travis, and thinking he was about to finally get some answers, he allowed them to get close enough to touch. They both calmly grabbed his arms and led him towards the table. He didn't want to go, but he felt like he should. Easily, they lifted him up and set him down on the flat surface. Travis began to resist a little, begging them to answer his questions, but instead they gently pushed him down on his back and the woman set a soft plastic oxygen mask to his face. Slowly, everything turned gray. Travis could feel himself drift between the line of consciousness and darkness. He didn't resist anymore. His body felt weak. The last thing he saw was the brilliant glow of the light overhead, and the two odd human faces staring down at him, watching his vision finally blur, then turn to black. When Travis finally came back to reality, his body ached and his mind was clouded. He opened his eyes to find he was no longer surrounded by strange-looking people on a spaceship, but now was lying on the cold pavement of the highway leading out of Haber, Arizona. The cold air did its work to jumpstart him awake, but he was still weak. He laid there on the pavement, staring up at the night sky, watching the stars glitter as they normally did. He knew he was back, but still wasn't quite safe. He needed to reach his family to let them know what had happened. His rubbery legs tried to support his body, but he found it increasingly difficult to stand straight, let alone walk into town to find help. It felt like hours had passed, and he knew his family would be wondering where he was. When he spotted the soft glow of an Exxon gas station a few miles away, he made a break for it, as fast as his wobbling legs could carry him. It took a while, but he finally made it and thankfully the phone didn't require payment for him to make a call. From this point on, we know what happens next. Grant and Dwayne come and save him, and Travis goes on to become somewhat of a celebrity in the UFO community after his story was revealed. He got a book deal out of it, called The Walton Experience, and was invited to speak on several shows where he could share his story to a wider audience. To this day, Travis Walton's story has become one of the most famous and authentic UFO abduction stories ever reported, and many are quick to defend the man when faced with scrutiny. But the truth is, Travis Walton's experience with the extraterrestrials from beyond the stars is constantly barraged by skeptics who still have questions that contradict the legacy. People are quick to point out the Walton's early obsession with UFOs and alien life long before the story even takes place. They believe the entire narrative was a hoax, claiming the Waltons wanted to be a part of something, something that had potential to bring them money or fame, or both. It's no secret Travis Walton's life has been put in the spotlight ever since. Ask any UFO enthusiast and the man's story is not far from their lips. The book deals, the movie deals, and the constant invites to UFO conferences to speak on panels has surely garnered the man a great deal of money and fame over the years. Then we also have to consider the polygraph test conducted throughout this whole ordeal. To this day, Travis has willingly submitted to the occasional polygraph test, 
Most results come back saying he's telling the truth, but quite a few others say the complete opposite. For example, the inconclusive test done by Pfeiffer was also examined by both examiners Gilson and McCarthy, who also agreed Travis did not pass the test, yet in his book claimed that he had for some reason. But it's also important to note that most examiners throughout the years, especially McCarthy, were out to disprove Travis. They had an agenda. Every polygraph examiner should be neutral. They should come into the situation without any bias. McCarthy was one of those guys who was a skeptic through and through. He wanted to prove Travis was lying, so perhaps his test and his opinion should be considered void. It's certainly a difficult case to disprove for any skeptic because it's well known nowadays that polygraph or lie detector tests are never 100% accurate. There are plenty of cases of people passing the test while lying, and there are just as many that fail when they are telling the truth. Maybe this is why we see such inconsistencies when over the years Travis has taken dozens and the results are in favor of his story, while others aren't and some are inconclusive. There's not also any real proof to say he wasn't abducted either, when considering the investigation for him and how six other men all claim to have seen the UFO as well, with five of those men passing the polygraph test and the other one coming back as inconclusive. But yes, the inaccuracies of the polygraph test work both ways. They may not have been telling the truth, but still managed to pass. But it's highly curious why six lumberjacks were able to pass or finish their tests, and all results said they weren't lying. We also need to consider a new perspective here as well. Just under 20 years after the incident and when the greatly exaggerated movie Fire in the Sky was released, a new person who was identified as Mr. X revealed he was a military intelligence operative who happened to be hunting slash camping in the woods that day back in 1975. He too claimed to have seen the strange lights in the sky, but never did see the abduction take place. Only that he could cooperate that something strange was indeed happening in the forest outside Snowflake. He was also then subjected to a polygraph test and was confirmed to be telling the truth about seeing something strange, but was said to be lying about his career. Travis had some suspicion the mystery witness might have been hired by a man named Philip Klass, the man who had also revealed the Pfeiffer test to have been inconclusive. Philip Klass was quite the character in that he wanted nothing more than to disprove Travis's story. Travis believed Mr. Klass had hired the man with the hopes the story would gain popular credibility, then publicly announced the whole thing was a hoax after Mr. X also later claimed the same. But this never did end up happening. We should also make a note here that Travis has since held true about his experience, meaning he has never once tried to make it sound more exciting or add extra little details here and there. He always repeats the same story word for word and sticks to the facts he knows. Credit where credit is due, oftentimes people will try and trip him up, asking him a question that contradicts what he has previously said in the past, but Travis always humbly corrects them and sticks to the story he has shared since 1975. In reality, there's no specific proof to say Travis did not have an encounter with extraterrestrial life. The only thing we have are the polygraph tests, and he has failed some, sure, but also passed many more. This is also why polygraph evidence is often not legally admissible in court. The witnesses to the flying saucer floating in the woods have also held true to their claim that they did indeed see something that night, despite some being bribed to retract their statements. But there's also not much evidence to say that any of this is at all true. Travis didn't seem to exhibit any injuries from the encounter, despite him saying his body burned and the witnesses saying a beam of light struck him, sending him flying into a large rock on the forest floor. Any medical examinations that had occurred never discovered any abnormalities with Travis's health or body, and the investigation never discovered anything odd or even any disturbed moss or pine needles where the abduction was said to have taken place. So to summarize, there is just as much evidence for people to say none of this happened as there is for people to say yes it did. We just don't know. As for my stance on the case, I can't say. I'm not fully convinced the experience Travis had was fully real, but I'm also inclined to believe something maybe did happen to him back in 1975. I'm just not fully convinced either way. I am, however, interested in what my listeners have to say about this case. Do you believe Travis has been telling the truth all these years, and he really did come into contact with extraterrestrial beings on a flying saucer? Or do you think it was all a hoax in order for the man to gain a mixture of fame and fortune? Let me know by emailing me at moonlightlorepodcast at gmail.com or by messaging me on Instagram. I'd love to talk about it more. 
Also, full disclosure, this episode was a little rushed because I've taken on some new projects in my life, so don't hesitate to tell me if I missed something or had gotten something wrong at some point. I think my research was accurate, but there's always room for corrections. Now, I think that is it for this episode. I want to give a special shout out to one of my Moonlight Legend Patreon supporters who requested this topic to be done. David Wright, thank you so much for the suggestion and thank you so much for being a supporter on the Patreon. If anyone else wants to request an episode be covered on the show, the Moonlight Legend tier on my Patreon allows you to request one, as well as also grants you a shout out and all the bonus episodes I post up there each month. If you enjoyed this episode or any other ones I've researched, written, and produced, please consider leaving a 5-star review on whatever app you might be listening on. It really only takes a second to do, and honestly not enough people do it, so I would be deeply appreciative if you could take the time to press that 5th star for me. But if you wanted to go a bit further, you could also post this episode or any others to your social media, or give the podcast a simple shout-out on your Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or whatever you most frequent. That way, all your friends and family can look up the show, and it will drive the numbers up, which helps the show immensely. I want to thank you all again for listening. It really does make me smile to hear so many people enjoying the show. And I also want to give a special thank you to those who continue to support the show, whether that be a good review or sharing it or supporting the Patreon. I appreciate it all. I mentioned I'm doing some other projects in my life that might eat up some of my time, but I'm hoping they won't get in the way of the podcast. So far, I don't think it necessarily has, but in the future, if there is a delay or I can't post a new episode because I don't think the quality is quite there, then I will definitely let you guys know. At the moment, I'm currently trying to brainstorm any potential holiday-themed episodes I could do next month. I know I haven't covered Krampus, the Yule Cat, or what have you yet, but that's only because every other podcast out there always covers those during the holiday season, and I just want to get you guys something different. Don't get me wrong, those topics can certainly be interesting, but... I don't know, everyone does them, and I want to stand out a bit. Give you guys something fresh in case you listen to multiple podcasts so you don't have to listen to the Yule Lad story a hundred times. But that also might mean it won't be holiday-themed. Still though, I think that's a better route to take than repeating the same story everyone else does. I'll try to find something we can do. Maybe I'll look into my bookshelf for any potential cases or stories that relate to the holiday or winter at least. But we'll see. I hope you all are staying safe this coming season, and I hope you all have a great start to your holiday. I will be coming back to you with a new episode in two weeks, hopefully. So until then, everyone, you stay safe out there. Take care. All right? All right, I'll see you later.